so welcome, welcome to the Research Center for Material Culture to the Museum Volkerkunde. My name is Wayne Modest and I'm head of the Research Center for Material Culture um, here at what we, we uh, our new name, the National Museum of World Cultures. Now, many of you will know that um, the Tropo Museum, the Museum Volkerkunde, and the uh, Africa Museum in Naimi emerged um, just over a year ago to create the National Museum of World Cultures. And um, out of that, um, we've been, I think, in the museum in an exciting process of, uh, of thinking about not just how the new institution works together, but, 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 but thinking critically about, with a number of our partners internationally as well, what is the role, the future, the present of the ethnographic museum? We have been in several um, um, projects. We're currently in a project called SWITCH, which is a Europe, European Union-wide project, with 10 under other ethnographic museum, museums. And this follows on um, another project called RIME, which was also with ethnographic museums across Europe, to explore this question. What is the future of our kind of museum? And what role can they play in society today? Um, With the merger, we decided to create the Research Center for Material Culture. And the Research Center is a space where we can critically reflect our own questions of um, the, our role in the present, but also to think critically about our collections. We have over 376,000 objects drawn from across the world and almost a million photographs. What do you do with those in the present? Um, how do we think about those collections that m many of which are um, from the past, many of which are 19th century collections? How do you mobilize them in the present to think um, with what is happening around us in our society today? So the Research Center um, stages a, a set of critical conversations, I would like to call them, um, throughout the year. Workshops um, as well to stimulate um, reflection on the, that question. More recently, we had a, a, a lovely collaboration with Light and Global Interactions. Um, um, Peter Pels is here and Carrie Nakamura is here, where we thought about the politics and politics of redress, thinking critically about questions of restitution, reparation, return, and what do, do those things mean. But bringing together the Tropa Museum, Museum Volkerkunde, and Africa Museum also um, brings up questions of time. And this conference on museum temporalities emerged out of a co ongoing conversations that I've been having with my colleagues. Whether it is Miriam Shatinawi who just curated the exhibition at the Tropa Museum on the 60s, the 60s are worldwide happening, and our conversation about what does it mean for an ethnographic museum to think critically, critically about a period, a time period, a decade. Or with Peter Pels, where we've been talking a lot and he had a research um, project going on called The Future is Elsewhere. And when I heard about that and sat with him uh, around that project, I thought, oh, that would be an interesting exhibition. I don't know that many publics would understand The Future is Elsewhere. But notwithstanding, what does it mean that The Future is Elsewhere? Thinking critically about issues such as great exhibitions, development, all of those things. But we are in a museum where many people have criticized us for representing people as out of time as past. So we wanted to engage with that as well. And in a more, one could suggest, mundane way, and I wouldn't want to think it mundane, and to be honest with you, I'm excited about the mundane. We also were interested in just the simple things like, what does it mean to have a fixed, permanent exhibition, and temporary exhibition? I don't know many, how many of you have gone to a museum with this big signpost which says, we are sorry, but we haven't renovated our exhibitions for the last pun, pun, pun years. Excuse us while we renovate. What does that mean to show an exhibition that is 20 years old in a museum in the present? So there are, these, are, these are all issues related to how we think about the museum and time and think even within the framework, and I, I used to, in my earlier life, think about conservation a lot. Think about the idea that conservation is supposed to try and keep things in perpetuity. How do you keep something forever? The, the, the massive challenge of keeping things forever. So these are some of the concerns 
things that we want to discuss today and tomorrow. And we pulled together, thankfully, and I, I'd like to say thanks to the speakers who I kind of um, <laughs> um, squeezed their arms to come here, I'm sorry. Some of them <laughs> even said to them, you know, you, 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 you can come just, we are going to have a little conversation. Uh, one person said the conversation is bigger than they thought it was. <laughs> But the, 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 to have a conversation, to think about it. Um, people who have been thinking about time in different ways. And so over the next two days, we will engage in a conversation around museum temporalities with you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I very much look forward to the next uh, two days. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's also an honor to be able to introduce this uh, particular uh, symposium, uh, partly also because I'm, I've only come to museums fairly late, and which is one reason why I would probably emphasize more the subtitle uh, and the anthropology of time than museums, although I hope I will be able to show you some things of how I think about exhibitions and collections and what I hope we can put on the agenda for the next uh, 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 two days. Um, as I said, I, I come to this um, from anthropology and especially from uh, a particular engagement with the reflexive turn in anthropology. Uh, it's, I regard that reflexive turn as having been about the way in which uh, we ourselves in modern societies, which include sciences like anthropology, uh, have uh, used certain primitive classifications, as you could say. And I advisedly use the word that came from the title of Durkheim and Moses' famous book, uh, because I feel we haven't turned the legacy of anthropology sufficiently onto uh, what you can call with a very reifying phrase, uh, modern culture. Uh, those uh, temporal, that reflexive uh, treatment of, of uh, class, primitive classifications, I see happening particularly uh, around in the 1970s and early 80s, and there are three uh, uh, different scholars that have put time on the agenda in a way that I think is still very much salient today. That would be Pierre Bourdieu, who in his critique of objectivism, uh, very much emphasized that people do not just live objective structures, but also very much in real time and therefore exchange things and, and have uh, uh, an irreducible temporality to the way they engage with each other. Then there's someone like Edward Said, in who in criticizing the way we use imaginary geographies, also uh, very much emphasized that they were largely meant to abolish time and to create a kind of st static object uh, of the Western gaze called the Oriental, for example. And then, not least, uh, there is Johannes Fabian, whom we have here today, uh, who taught me that uh, temporal classification itself is a crucial political gesture, uh, not only in the way anthropologists write about people, but also in the way that meshes with a much wider uh, modern culture that, uh, that, uh, that employs these uh, classifications. So I'd like to talk about primitive temporal classifications and how they uh, affect the museum. And primi with primitive, obviously, I don't mean uh, uh, any longer something way, way back in time, but very much uh, in the sense of fundamental, the kind of classifications that we do not think about enough when we are uh, working with these things. Uh, as far as museums are concerned, I'd like to emphasize three different themes uh, today. One is the critique of epochal thinking as a typical uh, characteristic of modernity, which you could also summarize as saying that modern people have a tendency to uh, invent a complex, which you could call modernity and tradition. They are never apart, they always exist together, and tradition is to a ex large extent an invention of modernity. 
Uh, I'd like to apply that to some of the uh, exhibitionary practices that we can think about uh, in the next two days. Then there's the theme of uh, what you could call uh, the problem of dead matter, uh, or what I prefer to call ideologies, existing ideologies of the artifact. The uh, particular problem there you could um, uh, link to modern culture by saying that it is about possessive individualism. When uh, this is the, the term uh, um, uh, coined by C.B. McPherson in his analysis of the work of people like Hobbes and Locke, uh, as creating a typical characteristic of modern people uh, as people who identify themselves by having something, right? You could say it's not about the cogito ergo sum, it's about the habeo ergo sum. Um, and once you have that, you, it implies a property that you can have, something that is static and commodified enough to be able to possess. And that implies that that property is, to a large extent, uh, supposed to be dead or at least unchanging. Um, I'll come back to that later on. And finally, uh, there is the theme of linear history and the problems we have with it, especially when linear history seduces us, seduces modern people into reifying the new. Uh, you could say that futurism uh, is very often also a claim to possession, a claim to have the future in a way that uh, other people don't. And this obviously is again part of this modernity and tradition complex because traditional people don't have the future, uh, modern people do. Um, that implies that we, if this is based on a reification of the new, then we might never have been historical enough. And so we have to go back to the problem of history, uh, uh, losing its irreversibility and its linearity in a certain respect. Um, as to my first theme, modernity and tradition, I'd like to give you the example of the uh, famous world exhibitions, and especially the juxtaposition you see here on the picture on the right of the Eiffel Tower, just built in 1889, juxtaposed to typical forms of tradition, in this case, an Ossian village, or on the left of that picture, the famous Rue de Caire, the Cairo street that became a sort of a staple of every world exhibition ever since. It is a story about not only inventing tradition, but also inventing it with a certain authenticity and therefore with always the running the risk of faking tradition, which uh, obviously the word invention of tradition itself uh, uh, points out. But of course it also went together in museums with the uh, thing that Wayne already referred to as the permanence of the exhibition. I can't sort of even start naming all the critical analysis of that particular a uh, um, uh, feature of museums, uh, uh, Tony Bennett, Christoph Pomian, many others have referred to that particular characteristic of a collection that aims at a kind of universality and finitude uh, that aims to be complete and therefore places itself outside of time. It uh, institutes a kind of taxonomic urge, as Susan Stewart has argued, that tends to abolish history and thereby, ironically, uh, also constitutes Europe as a civilization that is capable of that kind of universality. Uh, by the way, we just did a workshop at UCL on this particular feature of Europe from the outside in through the mode of collecting things. Another aspect of the modernity and tr as tradition complex uh, is also uh, the idea of the invented tradition that needs the image of a culture that is unchanging. Uh, and here I'd like to, to cut matters relatively short. I'd like to draw on uh, a wonderful essay, one of the few essays, I think, about the history of display in museums by Marijo Arnoldi on the, uh, on the Africa exhibitions of the, uh, of the Smithsonian, uh, where when the uh, uh, exhibition that had been in place for decades, right, unchanging, not reflecting any of the uh, any of the different changes in, for example, anthropological theory of the time, was changed by, in 1967 into a new Africa Hall uh, that, in fact, was already out of date when it was instituted. 
um, it, uh, it, it had to be changed shortly afterwards, and the current exhibition is, uh, to some extent, rather different. But the wonderful thing about Arnoldi's article is that she shows how much of that history is present, not only in the collection, as is, is a common idea, but also very much in the exhibition, and has a form of inertia that uh, I think is uh, important to discuss, uh, as Wayne suggested, maybe because it is not a necessary cultural feature of a museum at all. Um, the second set of issues in this, in this particular concern that I'd like to mention is that the critiques of that particular arrangement of museums, and many of them of the 1990s, um, have sometimes instituted their own linear history and their own form of evolution. Right, so that the story becomes not so much of achieving a universal collection uh, and successfully becoming a universal institution, but in fact, as many people have argued, celebrating uh, the ethnic group, uh, the, the nation states, uh, even the empire, uh, in such a way that, that this museum is more about the people who institute it than about the collections they exhibit. I think those temporalities are far more complex. Um, for instance, the, the fact that the imperial collection may aim for a kind of completeness and universality implies that it tries to put the empire in an exceptional position, right? a position that justifies its dominant status versus traditional societies. But this, of course, is complicated by the fact that we may argue that expertise, anthropological expertise, museum expertise, is something that has a, a, a life uh, span that is different from the kind of uh, uh, quick historical changes that we experience every day. Uh, the Universal Survey Museum, according to Christoph Pomian, has made a shift from rarity to representativeness, as he calls it. Uh, of course, described by many others as well, by Tony Bennett and, and others as well. And this raises the question, how do you do that in the first place? What does it mean to turn an object from a rarity into something representing something else? What kind of operations are necessary and how does that relate to time? Rarity has a very strange relationship to time because it, as it were, lifts the spectator out of its own time by the sense of wonder that it's supposed to generate. But is that sense of wonder at all something we understand in a temporal fashion? Wonder, as um, Ivan Karp and Corey Kratz have argued, is something that is also subject to historical change. We wonder about different things today than we did, uh, for example, when the Medicis first started uh, collecting things. So how does that difference fit into our understanding of time? Clearly, we can argue, as Timothy Mitchell did, did, that we celebrate the universal commodity with, for example, a world exhibition. But what does it make, what does it imply that a commodity, which very often we understand in a specific capitalist sense, so having emerged rather recently, how does that become universal in any sense? Here are a number of reasons why uh, what uh, Michel Foucault has argued uh, uh, is a heterotopia, a museum as a place where, uh, where uh, different uh, places can come together, as it were, also imply a heterochronic analysis. Not only the from rarity to representativeness issue, uh, not only how completeness underpins uh, a kind of exceptional, or expertise, uh, exceptional knowledge or expertise, but also what happens when exhibition styles themselves become history and people start to argue that they have to be preserved. Uh, famous two examples uh, here, uh, a famous example here is the uh, Mission Museum, about which I will talk a little more in style in the Netherlands, where the exhibit of 1934 is still in place. And uh, one wonders why and what it does to the audience when it actually visits. Uh, so the Mission Museum at Stijl on the right-hand side still recalls uh, a way of exhibiting of around the same time, uh, which in this case is represented by uh, a mission, ex mission exhibition of the Holy Ghost Fathers uh, in 1936, which I will address shortly. Uh, so the, the, I think the theme to take from this is something that, that implies that there are heterochronic paradoxes the moment you have 
a museum that is old, that turns itself into, a, into displays, and that then has to consider to what extent that performance is still uh, a reflection of the performance of the original exhibit. Um, it's never, in a way, the only model of the possibilities of exhibiting. And one simple thing to remind you of that is the World Exhibition, uh, which was always temporary, right, and disappeared after a while. The second theme on the artifact and ideologies of the artifact, I'd like to link to the notion of animation and the importance of time to animation. Of course, we have a lot of discussion of biographies of the artifact, and in fact, that is a way already of setting uh, museum uh, uh, objects into motion. Um, they are maybe the first challenge to the common tendency in material culture studies to reduce objectification to an interaction between a living subject and a dead object or an artifact. Uh, again, Bourdieu provides an alternative by talking rather about a dialectic of objectification and embodiment. And the moment you bring the body into uh, the process of uh, objectification, dead things start to change, I think, because the living aspect is being introduced into the process. And the life process and the body all imply taking account of time. They are impossible without it. Again, here I would like to use my uh, familiarity with the Mission Museum in Bergendal, or what used to be a Mission Museum, of course, is now part of the National Museum of World Cultures, the Africa Museum, where in 19, um, this is around 1959, I guess, uh, uh, a converted artifact, as Nick Thomas would have called it, uh, was being used as the logo of the museum. This is a Bapende mask. Uh, uh, it's said to be an initiation mask, but it's also very much, in the context of that museum, an idol, right? A thing that used to be revered, uh, then was handed over to the missionaries when uh, people gave up its original function and it was sent to the museum to be put on display. Somehow, that obviously, that biography of the object uh, calls up the question to what extent that artifact still retained something of the power it had in the situation where it came from in order to fascinate the public in the Netherlands where it was displayed. Uh, to what extent does that artifact, is that artifact capable of abolishing time? It needs a narrative. On the right hand side you actually see a photograph in the mission, missionary's journal a uh, set of photographs that are set in a totally different context. The story is actually about the Amazon missions of the Holy Ghost Fathers. But the caption on the right-hand side uh, identifies all these rather indistinct images as the fetisher and his shrines, uh, showing that you need this kind of narrative in order to make sure that you, uh, that you as an, as an, as a, you know, an audience coming to it as a stranger, you, do, you can identify it correctly. But at the same time, that doesn't explain why those photographs, as well as those images in the museum, were sufficiently attractive to the audience to actually come and pay money for it, which is what they were meant to do, which is what the museum was meant to do, right? Generate revenue for the, uh, uh, the mission. So there's this possibility that, in a way, James Clifford, I think, referred to in a famous 1983 article uh, or afterward with a book edited by George Stocking, to rescue the fetish somehow and to see whether it's still there. He didn't, I don't think he meant actually rescuing the fetish, I think he meant rescuing the rarity, but uh, that's something we might discuss later on. This, this animation of the artifact comes back very much uh, in a longer history of uh, the museum as a whole and the ethnographic museum in particular. Uh, I see it happening, for example, uh, at the start of uh, what you could call the emergence of a notion of patrimoine, which you could translate as heritage, um, uh, with Alexandre Lenoir, about whom uh, Cecilia knows far more than I can ever say. Uh, but it's related in the sense to uh, the fact that his Moni Musée du Monument Français, which became a kind of alternative to the Louvre, um, uh, at the time of the revolution, uh, was filled with what you could call sepulchral objects, emphasizing death, emphasizing memorialization, and therefore creating this double sense of time because it was never only about looking at the artifact, it was very much looking at other people 
who were made alive through that artifact, the Pantheon, with whom he had dealings, especially through the bones of Descartes uh, at the time, uh, is another example, a museum, in a way, of human remains, um, rather than artifacts. If you then turn to the Ethnographic Museum, I'd like to give you a quick uh, example of the life group, as it was displayed by Franz Boas, uh, inspired as he was by the World Exhibition in Chicago in 1893, where he first saw a Hamatsa performance, yeah, that's, that's the one uh, immortalized, as it were, by the mannequins in the, in the picture on the right. Um, he wanted to set up life groups, first in the National Museum and then later on in the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and to Boas, the life groups were instruments, in a way. They were, as, as uh, uh, Ari Jacknis called it, glorified stop signs that were meant to guide visitors to the more important knowledge displayed by the artifacts and the objects in the other cases nearby. But he also resigned himself to the thought that 90% of the audience came only for the entertainment, and the entertainment was provided by the life groups. And he uh, argued in his private notes, and I quote, it is an avowed object of a large group to transport the visitor into foreign surroundings. He is to see the whole village and the way the people live. But all attempts at such an undertaking that I've seen have failed, because the surroundings of a museum are not favorable of an impression of this sort. The cases, the walls, the contents of other cases, the columns, the stairways, all remind us that we're not viewing an actual village and the contrast between the attempted realism of the group and the inappropriate surroundings spoils the whole effect. Boas needed the magic of realism in order to get people to understand what he was, the message he wanted to convey to them. Um, but he also saw that that magic, that bringing alive of the object, was something that very much failed. This history, I would say, this is part of a history of a diorama in ethnographic and displays, but also very much in, in the history of taxidermy uh, and natural history museums and the like, that I feel we might discuss and we certainly still need to write and it shows that, in a way, museums had, and I think still have, the need and the desire for this animation of the artifact. Then uh, the third theme I'd like to cut relatively short because it is, to some extent, something that we are already somewhat familiar with. Um, but in a way, I think talking about museum temporalities and breaking up the tendency to make a linear narrative, a linear history out of it, could be restored, as Jim Clifford already uh, suggested, by looking back at museums as storehouses of wonder, um, and especially of a kind of exoticism that hasn't gone away, but given the need for animation, is still very much there. P.T. Barnum's American Museum is part of museum history, however much museum uh, professionals have tried to deny that the freaks that you see in this picture on the left were not part of that display tradition. The Chicago Columbian Exposition is also very much part of that history, despite the fact that we don't like the fact that live people were put on display, uh, that we don't really appreciate the fact that uh, you know, entertainment was mixed with uh, ethnographic uh, displays. Uh, as we can see in the small picture in the middle, uh, even the Hall of Anthropology set up by Putnam and Boas at the same time, at the same exhibition, displayed uh, a, live, uh, 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 a stuffed mammoth. Uh, we can go on like that, talk about reversals, returns, the way in which current uh, discussions need the, the notion of reparation and, that, and, and, re and repatriation, but also end up uh, talking about very different temporalities at the same time. And of course, once we talk, and we will do that later today, about heritage and all the difficult uh, uh, claims and discussions that releases, we are also very much talking about transformation and temporality. And that is where I would like to leave it for today. <laughs>